Hello, my name is Darren Evans. I'm Professor of Ecology and Conservation at Newcastle University. And I was delighted when the Natural History Society of Northumbria invited me to give a talk about the impacts of livestock grazing on upland biodiversity, as um, it's an opportunity for me to not only introduce you to our long-term grazing experiment called um, the Glen Finglas experiment in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, but also because um, the project is now in its 20th year, um, which is a cause of celebration for us, um, not least as it's really difficult trying to run these sorts of long-term experiments. And what I'd like to do today is to uh, essentially talk about the importance of the UK uplands for, uh, for biodiversity, um, whilst also considering what some of the drivers of change um, might be, and particularly uh, going forward uh, in the future. But I'm going to focus specifically on uh, livestock grazing and the impacts that that has on upland biodiversity. I'll then spend a little bit of time introducing you to the Glen Finglas experiment, uh, as well as the different ways in which we routinely sample the plants uh, and animal communities uh, up at Glen Finglas. But really what I would like to do is then just focus on some of the uh, short-term results that we got within the first years of the experiment, just showing how um, dramatic some changes can be when uh, livestock grazing pressure uh, is altered. Um, but then also contrasting that with some of the longer term results, which are currently coming through from the project, which can only be revealed through having uh, such long term projects such as this. And then if there's time, um, I'd like to just talk about how um, this uh, project and the data that we um, generate from it um, has influenced management and policy in the past, but also how it provides quite a unique uh, data set um, to inform some of the current uh, arguments around rewilding the uplands uh, in particular. So to provide just some context, um, mountains, moorlands and heaths cover about 20% uh, of the UK and you can see um, on the figure on the right here, um, the dominant habitats um, coloured by purple. Um, and these comprise the great majority of our near natural and semi-natural habitats um, and landscapes. So these are almost like the, the closest we can come to, to wilderness within uh, our country at least. But there have been substantial changes to the extent and the condition of these upland habitats since the end of the Second World War, and in particular, significant changes to our bog, upland and lowland heaths. But these sorts of habitats are also important to us as humans. Um, about 70% of our drinking water is sourced from upland habitats. 
Um, and these also provide uh, a buffer for water quality against point source pollutants, um, atmospheric pollution, and so on. Um, they also hold up to 40% of UK soil carbon. But crucially, um, in the context of this talk at least, um, these sorts of habitats are also of great importance for biodiversity um, as they have a unique assemblage of uh, plants uh, and animals. And as a result, large parts have been designated um, as nationally or internationally important uh, for conservation purposes. And of course, any of you who have uh, visited the Northumberland National Park, for example, will be familiar with the sorts of plants and animals that I'm talking about. So uh, classically, um, many of these areas uh, are dominated by um, heather species, for example, um, although other acid grassland species are important too. Um, but they also are home to a range um, of um, species of conservation concern, such as hen harriers. But the point that I'd also like to make is that these habitats um, are shaped by and managed by um, humans over hundreds if not thousands of years. So on the bottom left, um, this is a, a classic image from uh, the North York Moors National Park, for example, where you can see the heather dominated purple vegetation here at the top. But down in the valley, um, there is um, some agriculture going on. And again, on the bottom right, this is a view from my living room window in Rothbury, uh, looking towards the Simonside Hills, where again, you can see a whole range of different land uses from forestry through to uh, livestock grazing production, uh, through to golf courses, um, and now um, more, uh, more recently, uh, renewable energy. And so there are a range of drivers of change in the uplands, and there's a lot of focus around forestry at the moment, uh, particularly with um, afforestation targets um, across England, uh, Wales and Scotland. Um, we also know that these um, areas are, are managed for, for grouse moor, but there's also uh, increasing pressure from recreation, urban development, energy production, and, and so on. Um, but for the sake of today's talk, I'm going to focus particularly on the impacts of uh, grazing on upland biodiversity, but especially livestock grazing. Now we know that livestock grazing is a major driver of land use change uh, around the world and in a range of different ecosystems. But in Britain, between 1950 and 1990, sheep numbers more than doubled from around 20 million to over 41 million. And we also saw significant changes in cattle numbers too. And regions differed uh, in the ways in which uh, livestock grazing has changed. But in upland systems, this increase has generally coincided with a shift from traditional upland grazing systems, which consisted of mixed herbivores, so that's cattle, goats, sheep and horses, towards ones which were dominated by sheep. And so um, at the turn of the millennium, a range of conservationists were blaming livestock grazing for significant declines and changes to upland biodiversity. But up until that point, most of these studies were correlative and we lacked a mechanistic understanding actually of how and why livestock grazing actually impacted on biodiversity. So in 2002, we set up the Glen Finglas Upland Grazing Experiment in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. And at the time, we were specifically interested in finding out the mechanisms by which livestock grazing pressure impacted on the breeding success of birds. And I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. And there was 
lots of interest around not only understanding the mechanism, but also whether we might be able to mitigate those effects, for example, by reducing sheep grazing pressure, or perhaps having a return to a mixture of low intensity sheep and cattle production. But at the same time, we were also interested in, well, what, happened if, what happens if we lose livestock grazing altogether? After all, haven't many of these plant and animal assemblages been the result of hundreds, if not thousands of years of um, agricultural management in some form or another? So um, we approached uh, the Woodland Trust, um, who had recently acquired the Glen Fingless estate. And traditionally, um, the area had been managed intensively for sheep production. And the Woodland Trust took it on as they were keen to make it part of the Trossachs Forest and thereby um, helping them in their ambitions to create the largest broadleaf woodland in southern Scotland. And what we did was say to them um, at the very start um, of that project, could we establish some experimental plots whereby we control sheep and cattle number and change their numbers um, for the long term uh, to see what impact that has on biodiversity and um, the Woodland Trust have granted us that permission and have continued to support us uh, in that work up till today. Um, and here's a lovely uh, view of, um, of Glen Finglas and you can see that um, it's um, basically a, a mixed upland uh, acid grassland. It's mostly dominated by grass species. There, there are heather species up there as well. Um, but again, it's an area which has been hammered, if you like, by livestock grazing for many years. And in 2002, we marked out where we wanted to put these experimental uh, plots. Um, and in 2003, we set up the fencing here, as you can see uh, on the right. And from 2003 onwards, we started controlling the numbers of sheep and cattle in these plots and have been able to do that ever since. But the star of the show really um, is this bird here, the meadow pipit. So the entire experiment was designed around um, this bird species uh, and in particular giving us um, enough statistical power or enough certainty, if you like, to begin to really understand the mechanisms by which livestock grazing affected the breeding success of birds. And we chose meadow pipits because they're the most common upland passerine in the UK. They're kind of like the house sparrows of the uplands. They're um, a ground nesting species, so they could be impacted by livestock grazing. Um, they're also insectivores, so whatever happens to the plant community by the grazers could impact on the um, arthropods which these birds are feeding on. But they're also a key part of the upland food web. We know that they're a major source of prey for birds of conservation concern, such as hen harriers, merlin, and so on. We also know that they have similar requirements to other species of conservation concern uh, in the uplands. And it's worth noting that meadow pipits themselves uh, are amber listed, having undergone um, quite significant population declines um, in recent years as well. So in terms of the experiment itself, essentially what we did was created 24 plots or fields where we uh, fenced them off and we controlled the number of sheep and cattle inside the plots, or we excluded the livestock altogether. So we had what we called four experimental treatments. Now, it's important <laughs> that we try and remember these experimental treatments when it comes to talking about the results. But in treatment one, we essentially wanted to replicate the level of livestock grazing pressure that there was at Glen Finglas at the start of the experiment. So within each of these fields, we put nine sheep. We then wanted to find out what happened if we reduced 
that stocking density by a third. So again, um, in treatment two, we had three U's per field. We were also interested in finding out what happened if we mixed um, sheep and cattle together. So in treatment three, we had uh, two sheep. Um, and then in the autumn, we put in um, some cattle as well. And the idea there was that the amount of vegetation eaten or taken off from the fields in treatment three would be the same as in treatment two. And then we also wanted to know, well, what happened if we if we excluded livestock altogether? So treatment three is a uh, treatment four, sorry, uh, is our ungrazed treatment. So treatment one is at the conventional stocking density at the time, which was uh, nine ewes uh, per plot. We then wanted to reduce that by a third. Uh, so we had three ewes. We also had a mixture of sheep and cattle, which is treatment three. And we also had ungrazed plots. And essentially what happened was we bunched these uh, plots together um, in three blocks, which we um, located around uh, the Glenfinglas estate. And essentially we did this in such a way to try to um, capture round about five pipit breeding territories per plot or per field. Um, so this we um, had calculated would give us what we call sufficient statistical power to determine whether the livestock grazing treatment was impacting on the, the breeding success um, of the birds. So the size of the plots and the locations of the plots um, was all designed in such a way um, to, um, to wrap around the ecology of, of meadow pipits. Okay, so remember the treatments one, two, three, and four. So in terms of what this looked like, so here's some maps um, of our sampling points um, at Glen Finglas. Um, and essentially we've got um, our treatments and replicates here. Um, again, 24 fields located uh, across different parts of the estate. Um, within each of those experimental plots, we have 25 sampling points, which I'll come to um, in a moment. But this is just sort of to help you visualise at least um, the layout of the plots um, at Glen Finglas. So in terms of um, our methods, what we were uh, interested in doing was finding out um, around the, 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 the plants themselves. So at each of those 25 points per plot, um, we would essentially go every year and we would measure the plant height, the density, we would record um, the vegetation community uh, and so on, and how that changed um, across the season. But also at those points, we were interested in um, collecting information on uh, arboreal arthropods um, and also soil arthropods. But in particular, we were focusing on the types of arthropod prey that meadow pipits um, might be feeding on. So um, leather jackets or crane fly larvae was obviously uh, an important part of that. But we also sampled um, for um, other flies, for, for caterpillars, beetles, bugs, spiders, and so on. Um, and we did this through um, a range of methods. And imagine, if you will, going for a, a nice pleasant walk in the National Park and then seeing this chap coming over the horizon, looking like a spaceman with um, a massive vacuum um, attached to his back. And this is my colleague, uh, John Scarpvite, who was essentially visiting each of those points within the plots and using this suction sampling to collect um, the uh, arthropods uh, at each of those points. Um, but he also used some sweet netting as well to, to capture some of those insects and also took some soil cores um, in order to uh, look for these um, crane fly larvae 
which were uh, heat extracted from the soil. In terms of uh, the birds, so this was um, my part of the project. We were um, essentially interested in mapping the territories of all the different birds within our experimental plots. But I was also interested in finding nests and we needed to find around about 100 meadow pipit nests per year in order for us to see whether the sheep grazing pressure was impacting upon their breeding success. And of course, each of those fields being about three and a half hectares inside, took a lot of work in order to cover, to, to find those nests. And it's a bit like finding uh, a needle in a haystack. Uh, but thankfully we had um, a range of beer cans to hand, um, not quite sure where they came from. Um, and what we did was we attached them to um, this rope, as you can see in the image on the right, and we'd essentially walk up and down um, each of the experimental plots regularly dragging this rope. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with meadow pipits, when they're breeding, when they're, when they're on eggs, um, it's very difficult for them to flush um, and to leave the nest because obviously they want to protect um, their eggs or, or, or their young. Um, but if you get very close, then you may see a bird sort of flushing quite close to your foot. What we did with the cans was we dragged them across the vegetation uh, in such a way that if a can came near a, a bird that was on a nest, um, the bird would flush, we would drop the, the, the rope and we could go down to the point where we saw the bird flush and then we could look to see if we could find its nest. Um, and as you can see in the image here of the eggs and the chicks, we, we, we were able to use this method quite successfully. Um, once we found a nest, um, we would uh, measure the eggs um, and then we would continue to monitor that nest, um, ring the chicks, measure them, um, and ultimately see um, how many of those went on to fledge so that we could see whether our grazing treatments affected the breeding success of these birds. Now, there are other major players um, in this system too. Um, field voles um, were the most common rodent at Glen Finglas. They're also an important uh, food source for a range of um, upland birds and mammals. Um, and the thing to note here is that they experience these population cycles where they go through kind of like a boom and a bust um, over a, a, a several year period. Um, so we wanted to um, also record these um, because we thought that this is an important part of the food web. And similarly, um, uh, red foxes as well um, were also of interest to us. We knew that the predator, predator numbers were controlled um, in many upland estates in the area, included uh, Glen Finglas. But we also know that these will predate ground nesting birds and other small mammals. So we wanted to get some idea of whether the grazing treatments were also impacting upon these animals. Um, but rather than exhaustively catching, counting and collecting them, instead we used um, a range of proxies uh, for measuring them. So for field voles, we can use what's called a vole sign index, where at each of those uh, points we can throw a quadrat and we can look for signs of droppings or fresh clippings. Um, which uh, again tells us something um, about their populations. And we would do this in April and October of each year. And similarly, uh, we also looked for fox scats uh, as well as a proxy of uh, red fox activity within um, our experimental plots. So that's kind of like a, a brief introduction of the plants um, insects, mammals and birds that we were um, interested in um, collecting information from, from the project. So what I'm going to do now is just give you um, some of the results that we got at the start of the experiment and then sort of move on to see how that contrasts with some of our longer term uh, data. And the first thing here um, is the results from our vegetation density and height work. 
uh, which we commenced in 2003. Um, and as you can see um, on the bottom here, the blue line, that represents our intensively grazed treatment, treatment one, where we had nine sheep per plot. Uh, the green is treatment two, where we've reduced that to three. Um, the orange is treatment three, which is a mixture of sheep and cattle. Um, and the uh, purple uh, is the ungrazed plots or the ungrazed treatments. Um, and there are two things to note here. Firstly, we can see that the density and the height of the vegetation changes throughout the season. Perhaps that's not surprising. Um, but what we were also able to show is that there were differences between treatments. So the density and the height of the vegetation was lowest in the intensively grazed plots treatment one. And when you remove them all together, the density and the height was um, highest. So uh, if nothing else at this stage, um, it could show us that our experimental treatments were working um, in terms of having an impact on the vegetation. But in the early years, there was no uh, effect at all on the overall community composition and structure of the plants. It was simply the livestock grazing pressure was changing the density and the height. But when we started looking at the total arthropod biomass, so this is kind of pooling all of the information together. In 2002, that was the start of the experiment before the uh, experimental fencing had gone up. Um, and we could see more or less that the, um, the, the arthropod biomass was, was sort of constant across treatments one, two, three, and four. But by 2003, we started seeing this pattern emerging. Remember, this is sort of the first year that the experiment started, where the lowest arthropod biomass was in treatment one, the intensively grazed plots, and the highest arthropod biomass was in treatment four, which is the areas, uh, of course, where we'd excluded livestock altogether. By the time we got to 2004, so two years after the commencement of the grazing treatments, um, we could begin to see some statistically significant changes, um, whereby, again, in treatment four, uh, the ungrazed treatment, we had substantially higher arthropod biomass than in the intensively grazed plots treatment one. Now, the point to note here as well is that in treatment three, we had almost the same sort of biomass. Remember, this is the treatment with a low intensity mixture of sheep and cattle. But when you start to break this data down, you actually begin to see that there are winners and losers uh, in terms of how different arthropod groups respond to the grazing treatments. So in the top left, this shows um, the data broken down um, uh, for our spider groups. And again, um, they do particularly well in the ungrazed um, treatment compared to the intensively grazed treatment. But then when we start looking at some of the flies, for example, we found, again, after just a couple of years, they tended to do better um, in treatment three, which, if you remember, is a mixture of the sheep and cattle. And again, whether it's the cow pats in particular, which are attractive and bring in more flies in, um, we're, we're still interested in finding out. If you look over here on our leather jackets, for example, remember, these are the ones found in the soil. There's um, a reverse trend where, on the whole, we find more of those in the intensively grazed plots than we do in the areas where livestock have been removed altogether. So the point here is that although overall, when we combine all of our data, it looks like the ungrazed plots are better, um, if you like, for arthropod biomass. Actually, when you start breaking it down by groups, there are winners and losers. And I think this is really important when it comes to considering the overall context um, of these studies for, for future land management.
Interestingly, when we started looking at the effects of grazing treatment on breeding meadow pigeons, we found actually that um, there were quite striking effects, again, very, very similar to the arthropods, which could be explained by changes in the arthropods, for example. So um, essentially what we did here was we, cal we, we calculated the egg volume index. Um, sorry, there's some RAF jets have just gone over the house, see if you can hear something in the background. Um, we, ca we calculated the egg volume index um, of the eggs that we found in picket nests at the start of the project. Um, and then we contrasted that with the post-treatment effects, which is after the experiment started. And we found this a significant effect of treatment, whereas pipettes on the whole tended to produce larger eggs in treatment three than they did in either treatment one, which were the intensively grazed plots, or treatment four, which were the plots where livestock had been excluded altogether. And we find this um, as, a, as a measure, uh, quite a good measure of the quality of the environment um, for, for female birds in particular. Um, and it shows us that uh, in some way there could be an advantage of a bird um, producing eggs uh, in nests within uh, treatment three. And we know that larger eggs generally within bird species um, result in birds having um, uh, a higher chance of recruiting into the subsequent breeding population. So although we started finding these interesting um, effects, it wasn't really until a few years in that we began to see some significant effects of the grazing treatments on the number of breeding territories of pipits. So again, we've got the data plotted here through 2003, four and five, and the black bars, as you can see, um, by 2005, we were finding on the whole more meadow pipits uh, breeding within treatment three than we did within the conventionally grazed treatment one and the no grazing treatment four. So treatment three seemed to be better uh, in terms of pipit um, egg size, at least, um, and also the number of territories. Although at that stage, we still hadn't found any significant effect of the grazing treatment on the breeding success of the birds. Instead, we found more subtle effects on components of breeding productivity. But what we also found was that the livestock grazing affected the amplitude of the vole population cycles. So again, what we have here uh, on the top line is uh, our vol sign indices. You can see them fluctuating. Um, this is for treatment four where they're excluded altogether. Um, and the black line represents treatment one where essentially the amplitude of that cycle um, has been suppressed slightly by the intensive sheep grazing. And it's not surprising because obviously the, the, the sheep um, are large herbivores the voles are small herbivores, and there's going to be some competition for the vegetation here. But this was still quite an interesting result because it was the first to demonstrate that livestock grazing pressure impacted upon the um, vole population cycles. And then what we did was related that to some of the uh, fox activity within the plots as well. And again, we found that fox activity was tightly associated with um, our volsine indices, um, but also these were affected by our experimental treatments as well. So again, we're seeing compartments of this upland food web being changed by our livestock grazing treatments. And this is all kind of very novel and very interesting and was providing us some understanding of the mechanisms affecting upland birds in particular. And we think for meadow pipits, um, their breeding um, success is, is actually a function of um, arthropod um, availability as opposed to abundance. 
uh, because in treatment four, where livestock are removed altogether, um, we find that there are more arthropods, but pipits do better in treatment three, and we think it's having the sheep at low density and cattle at low density in those plots that actually opens the sward and creates patches which allows those birds to forage um, and therefore that translates into better um, breeding outputs. So that was the, the start of the experiment and normally those sorts of projects end at that stage. Um, but actually we managed through uh, by crook to, to keep the project going um, in different ways. Um, and we would still go up and do um, our bird surveys and vol surveys. And we've been pleased to, to have been able to do that every year, except of course uh, for COVID. But it was only very recently that we began to see changes to our upland plant communities. Um, so again, you know, it could take 14 or 15 years before you start seeing changes to your upland plants. And we found that species that benefited from increased grazing included sweet vernal grass, mat grass and deer grass. And that species that benefited from the removal of grazing included bog asphodel, bracken, and blabry. But the key point in this sort of result from the long-term study is that the responses differed between vegetation communities. So more productive acid grasslands after 15 years or so of grazing showed little change when grazing was removed, whilst less productive, productive mire communities contained species capable of increasing after grazing removal. So it's worth bearing in mind again what some of the winners and losers of changes in grazing in the uplands is going to have on your upland biodiversity because obviously that's important in terms of what sort of biodiversity we want to conserve going into the future. And if anybody's interested in reading more then please see this work by Robin Pakeman and others in the Journal of Applied Ecology. But what we also have been able to do is sort of see how there have been changes to the arthropod biomass as a result of our livestock grazing treatments. And this is a project by one of my former PhD students, Lisa Marm, where she essentially looked at that arthropod data that I showed um, from the 2005 period and then compared it with her own survey 10 years later uh, in 2015. Um, and again, what we can see here um, is data broken down by um, whether they're spiders, uh, beetles, flies, uh, uh, moths or so on. And interestingly, what we find after 10 years is this sort of increase um, in arthropod biomass in treatment two, which is um, an area where we've just lowered livestock grazing pressure of sheep um, in particular by a third. And again, interestingly, we're finding uh, more Lepidoptera uh, in this survey um, after many years of the uh, experiment running. So again, you know, it's important for us to sort of see how these changes occur over a longer time period. Um, instead of jumping to conclusions from results from just a few years after the experiment had actually started. But bringing all of this back together around birds and meadow pipits in particular. So again, Lisa did a study where she replicated my work back in the early days. Um, and we still, although we found that the livestock grazing pressure affects some aspects, of the breeding productivity of meadow pipits, there is still no overall impact on breeding success. But one of the interesting things that Lisa found when she was doing her territory mapping is actually there is now a um, significant effect of our grazing treatment on bird species richness. So at the start of the experiment, you know, the, the experiment was designed around meadow pipits. We had very few other bird species 
nesting within these plots. But when Lisa came back and resurveyed those birds um, within 2015 and 2016, we actually found a significant effect of treatment with more bird species being found in treatment four, which is our ungrazed treatments. So again, what this is implying is that if you remove livestock grazing pressure from a given area, you might actually see an overall increase in bird species richness. So what does that mean for rewilding? Well, I haven't got time to, to talk about that, I'm afraid, but Lisa produced a really nice article in The Conversation where she covers all of these sorts of topics and the pros and the cons of different um, forms of livestock grazing or removing livestock grazing altogether on, on upland biodiversity. And in the end, us sort of having a, a fresh look about what are the winners and losers of changing upland livestock grazing pressure. And so what we're trying to do uh, now as the project proceeds is to better understand this upland food web and in particular the linkages between the plants, arthropods and animals using um, what we call an ecological network uh, approach. Um, and again, we're hoping um, to keep the project running for as long as possible because we know that these changes to the uplands are going to be seen over, over decades. So it's important that we have this sort of information. So to conclude, what we found was in the short term, the Glenn Fingless experiment showed that livestock grazing affects the vegetation height and density, but it doesn't affect vegetation communities. It affects arthropod biomass with highest biomass in the ungrazed plots. But different groups respond differently to these livestock grazing treatments. In terms of avian reproduction, we can conclude that too many or too few sheep in the uplands adversely affects pipits in terms of their egg size and breeding abundance. But the population implications for this are unknown, and we still don't really know how that impacts on the wider upland food web. In, in terms of the vole population dynamics, we know that intensive grazing dampens the cycles and that fox activity is driven by changes to, to the voles. In the long term or the longer term, we are only just beginning to show changes in both the plant and animal composition, but we still have no effect on pipit breeding success yet and maybe we need another 10 years of grazing before those effects become quite marked. And with the future of the uplands uncertain, the experiment is providing valuable data to inform policymakers of the biodiversity impacts of changes to upland management. So whereas in the past we were looking at the mechanisms of livestock grazing and how they affected upland birds, we and now sort of the, the spectrum's gone um, or the pendulum has gone to, to, to the other side in that the policy interest is, well, what happens if we lose livestock grazing altogether, which is currently being considered in the context of rewilding um, and, and how uh, public payment for public goods and services um, plays out in the future. We know that many of our upland areas have been identified for afforestation whether that's um, deciduous or coniferous uh, woodlands remains to be seen. But what we have got at least is some data here and some um, evidence to suggest to policymakers what the impacts of having livestock grazing remain, whether we reduce it or have a mixture of sheep and, um, and cattle, or whether we stop grazing altogether, what the impacts of that on upland biodiversity is. And in that sense, that's a really good thing to have. I appreciate um, I've gone slightly over time and I'm sorry if it's just been a, a whistle stop, stop tour of the Glenn Fingers experiment. For anybody interested in finding out more, there is um, a link to the James Hutton Institute website. Um, James Hutton Institute are currently managing the project. There's more information on the experimental design and all of the publications from the project can be found there. Do take a look. I've only covered um, a very small fraction of the work.
so far. Um, and also, uh, we'd like to thank the Woodland Trust for allowing us to continue work there. Um, there's been so many people involved with uh, collecting and analysing this data over the 20 years. Um, I'd like to just sort of say thanks to, to everybody that's worked on the project. Um, and again, uh, the project is now part of the Ecological Continuity Trust um, as well. So again, you can find out more information there. But again, this is one of the reasons why we need to sort of have and maintain these long term experiments, because the impacts of environmental change are going to be long term, not just short term. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't have as, enough studies of, of this nature. So uh, if nothing else, I hope I've convinced you of the importance of, of having long term experiments to understand how biodiversity responds to environmental change. Thank you very much for listening.